hello and welcome to the blueprint of the universe channel and in this particular video we follow the path that we've been looking at of uh, the books that i've written as part of the series now we come to the one of the last books in the series that's in my opinion um extremely important in the teachings of uh, spirituality, development, self-development, progression and understanding of the universe around us um, and it kind of is, it's a book on its own uh, but it also does link with everything else uh, in this series as well and it's called Our Sacred Space. Now it covers a variety of topics Now I'm just going to go through some of the things it includes but equally give you an overview of what we're talking about here because it is an extremely complex um, subject as well and it's very difficult to understand or explain fully in such a small video and to get the point across what we're going to do is basically simplize it down um, into an explanation of what symbology really is now when I try and explain to people I'm a symbologist or I study symbology um, and I've took several symbology courses in the past as well which are uh, interesting because obviously i'm just trying to one further my own knowledge this was post um, creating this book actually um, but equally to kind of understand what is out there um, in the context of what symbology is and it's very diluted down um, as always and yet obviously it plays a contextual part of um of what the action is so basically the kind of modern concept is that symbology is understanding the um, deeper meaning of, of symbols which is you know fairly straightforward and common sense however it's a lot deeper than that there's more to it than that so when we look at people who do look at symbology in the modern times we tend to it's a um, tick box exercise, almost looking at, so they pick a symbol, doesn't matter what it is, and then they will look at how that symbol's been used through time and kind of address the um, previous ownership of those symbols. But that, to me, just like everything else we've looked at in this channel, is scratching the surface because just because a, a culture or a society or a group or a company or a business uses a symbol doesn't mean they understand or have used it in its original or meant to be used form. And so I want to just take a, a few minutes to kind of explain what real symbology is because it's not an cum accumulation of various symbols being used in the past. It's a it's a mindset, it's a ability that we as human beings in our conscious, subconscious mind possess. It's not, it can be applied to everything as opposed to just being used to explain a few things that have happened or occurred in, in, in previous history. Now, this to me has become second nature. It's actually the way my brain works. And interestingly enough, um, again, it's difficult to explain because once you start doing it, it's kind of a realization of how actually that is how the brain is meant to function. That's how it is designed for. And strangely enough, it's actually the same way we use computers today. Uh, software, um, specifically, is a direct interpretation of how the brain works because it's a natural progression of how to store, access, and utilize information. Now that might seem a little bit strange, but let me just take you through it. So, the brain works in a, a essentially a hard drive of retaining information. And we only get information by having life experiences. We learn, we read, we, knowledge, we, we have knowledge, we gain knowledge, we apply knowledge, we have practical application, um, and so on. And it all comes through various different sources and um, you know ways of, of gaining information through the senses. And we have to have a way of compressing that down. So again, we use the idea of the conscious and subconscious mind. And what we look at is again the idea of images and sounds 
So if we write a book, for example, and we read a book, it can take quite a long time to read a book, uh, obviously depending on the size of it, but it takes time to read the words, um, then put them into the mind, and what we tend to do is, once we've read them, we then create images in the mind of, to so say, for example, we're writing about a location in a book, well then we imagine that location in our minds, and yes, there's a certain amount of personal um, opinion on that location, like it'll differ to everybody who reads that book according to personal experiences, and that's the subconscious acting from the conscious. And it's like when we say, well, a picture paints a thousand words. Well, it does, because when you see an image, you can you could spend a lifetime describing a painting and the words in it and the, uh, the what it means, because the image is... It's, it's more complete, it's more, it accesses the subconscious in ways that words never can. And what we do in the modern age is we forget that, and a lot of people think in words. And it might sound very strange to you, but some people think in images. I myself only really think in images. Um, and the reason for that is it's faster. And it, it takes practice, it takes a lot of, of time and effort to develop this skill. Some people do it straight away. Um, because they've had to kind of not have to unlearn it. It's, it's, it's an extremely complex subject, which I don't want to go into on this video. Um, but just take my word for it. Some people don't think in images. Some, most people think in words. And it's actually, when I'm teaching people, it's one of the first things I ask when I'm trying to teach someone so I know how is best to give them information to help them develop themselves. Because if they think in images already, well, then it's easier for me to kind of get to these later stages. Whereas if you think in words, well, then I need to find a way of helping you understand how to um, develop your subconscious to think in images. Because otherwise you'll never get this, uh, these later concepts of spirituality and self-development. Because if you don't understand how to think in images, you'll never understand symbology. Um, unfortunately, that's the realism of the situation because a symbol is an image and if you can't think in images or how images associate to volumes of information then you'll never understand what a symbol really is so it's an extremely important technique for the mind to understand so when let's look at the use of, of um, symbols okay so let's have an example so if I am creating a project, and again I'll use an example of a hard drive or um, software on the computer. If I'm in a university and I'm creating a project about whatever, some sort of group project, and I'm starting to gather over a period of a year all these different parts of information, research, statistics, um, you know, news clippings, work that we've written as a group and put together, all these different things, a year's worth of written down content all these experiences everything else now that's a lot of information and it's difficult to remember all that information and if you did that every year your brain would become saturated and overwhelmed and it's extremely difficult to them because you're seeing everything separately um this newspaper clipping this um, book this interview this statistic so when you need to recall it it's hard in your brain because you have to go through right okay well that was it this period of time and with that person and it was this um, piece of information and then you have to maybe go find it and reread it again because you can't remember all of it but what if then at the end of that project for example you made a folder and you put all that information into a folder and you put that folder and you marked it as uh, you, you give it a, a circle and you constantly think about that circle representing everything within that folder now that symbol becomes a very simple object but has a greater meaning because it means all this yearly information that you've gathered and experienced and you can compress it down, it's like a zip file, you compress all that information down and you store it in your brain as a symbol. And anything that re relates to it in the future can be added to it or you can go to that folder and write, um, I need to remember what was in that project six years ago. Well, it was that circle um, and 
it represents this. So let me just think about that circle for a minute. And then you can open up that folder in your mind and see all that information. It comes back to you. And it's surprising, actually. It does work because you can visualize it in your brain as um, images. You can't remember the words, but you can remember images of uh, statistics, graphs, interviews, life experience that you had. It's a lot more efficient than just trying to pile on written word information every day. It's a way of storing and using, and say like software and Windows and documents. That's how you use document folders. That's how a computer uses it to compress information to stop you having... Imagine if you didn't have folders on your computer. How difficult would it be to search through a billion images that you've downloaded? Uh, whereas you can categorize them and link them together into a database to then bring up certain relevant things that you're trying to find. It's faster because that information is there. It's just sorting it, sourcing it properly. And that's what symbology does in a roundabout way. There's a lot more to it than that, but basically that's how it works within your brain. So when you think of a book, you think of everything that was in that book, for example, on the book cover helps. I recognize books not by the title um, or the name. I see a book as a book. I can recognize not the name, like, for example, um, you know, a certain series will look a certain way. They'll have the same text on the side. It'll be in the same font, in the same color. It'll be the same width books, roughly, in the same height. And to me, I can pinpoint which book and which series that is based on what it looks like, as opposed to what's written on the side because it's faster because again light travels faster than sound and we can see images quicker than we can read and that's how the brain works it processes images faster and links emotional content and experience to it faster than it does reading it and try to understand it from something we've read and that's extremely important it's a good skill to have and it's how the mind works so we need to lead into that so when we talk about real symbology we're talking about the mind connecting all sorts of information to every single thing possible we can take a chair for example and the chair the more information you have on that chair is linked to that chair therefore that chair means more than just a sitting device we can see, well, it's made from this type of wood. Well, I know that these trees make this kind of wood in this location and they grow like this. And animal, the certain animals and other plants and fauna live within those trees or the forest. Um, and those forests are more inclined to grow in wet weather. And you can make a database and collect all it. And that might seem sad to some people, but actually you're just learning. You are literally just learning. That can be anything. And why wouldn't you want to learn about everything that you are connected to um, like for me it was interesting because I studied design tech at college and it was all about processes um, creating how to create objects design objects and the best manufacturing process to make them so whenever I look at anything chair tape we used to play a game with one of my best friends we used to um, he used to pick something he used to say right what's that made out of um, and you'd have to give the material it was made out of, the compounds and the, the manufacturing process that it was done for and its qualities. Um, so for example, um, blow molding, injection molding, um, and, and you would play this game. So really we will start to link all these, uh, this information to any object we could look at. And it's the same with anything and you start to apply things. And it's not just that, it's like, where did you buy it? Which shop? Well, what else was in that shop? Where was it located? Did I, did I have any experiences on that day out in that shop that I went to? Things start to mean more to you. And the more things mean to you, the more life experiences you have, the more value you have for life, the more value you have for your home. You're not just going to Ikea and buying a job lot matching seat, um, furniture. You're individually picking out... Um, objects to go in your home you're making it yourself for example I make a lot of the furniture in my own home shelving the fireplaces, the floors um, I do the tiling myself the plastering, the rewiring because then I'm creating a connection with my house, my home 
I have done these things. I know exactly how it worked. I know exactly where things lie within the walls. I know exactly the oldest, newest parts of it which may create problems um, or need to be replaced down the line. I understand um, where the wood came from, the experience that went behind planning it, designing it, shopping for it, having it delivered the day off work that I had to um, be off to do it, which then creates memories and a bit of pride and it gives you meaning uh, within things. But this this is all personal, okay, this is all personal stuff. But what about universal symbology? Now this is where it gets interesting because it's not just about you, it's about how the universe associates certain things with certain objects and symbols. And again, we've a symbol is literally an object, it's something, of anything that you can see, an image. And then we can apply things to it from experience. It's as something as simple as that image, doesn't matter what it is, is the colour blue. And that particular shade of blue is linked to whatever, you know, um, the sea, this particular flag. Um, and then it brings back memories of that and, and, and so on and associations. Symbols such as anything to do with geometric numerology, the cross, the number four, the pentagram, hexagrams, circles, every everything has a meaning to it. And it's not just ones we're just adding for pointless effect. These are things that have been used in the past, again by people, but also as a universal truth, where, for example, um, you know, we right, we will look at the specifics in a moment. I don't want to go through them all because it's countless, but I'll give you examples of why the book has been created. So the book is called Our Sacred Space, and it relates to all spaces in the universe. And we're not just talking about rooms, I'm talking about buildings, I'm talking about our body. Our body is a space with meaning, symbolic meaning. Um sacred spaces that we do have such as places of worship places of study so for example let's start looking into this now very briefly i begin in this concept by in this book by explaining symbology and how it works in the mind but then we start going specifics and we start just as we have done in the blueprint of the universe series in a numerical pattern so we start with zero now zero is a symbol for a circle and a circle is a boundary or a border that symbolizes the division between what's within a circle and outside of the circle. In finance you have things called ringed fence which basically um, are kind of financial constructs that are separate to other financial constructs. So when we look at investments, for example, we have ring fenced investments um, and anything outside of that ring fence is dealt with separately to what's within because it's a symbol act of um, division, dividing, creating a border or a boundary. Now that border or boundary is technically um, under debate for whoever's looking at it because they could say, well, I, I choose to link what's within that border with the same thing as what's without that's fine but it's a representation and that's the other thing some borders and boundaries are only visible by those that know about them so for example a border or a boundary could be a social border a social boundary it doesn't have to be a physical one it can be a agreement in place by the people using that space now what happens to somebody who is not from that space, that culture, that community, well they are not aware of that boundary, that social barrier of maybe not asking these questions or not mentioning these certain topics, but they don't know about it because there's nothing to indicate that barrier exists, therefore giving it a perception or a perceived non-barrier. But that doesn't mean it's not there, it just means that you're not aware of it or in line with it, which is fine. Um, but it's your responsibility to learn about these things when you go in space, which is adding value or adding information to whatever it is that you're looking at. And again, this can be physical because most people, when they walk through doors, for example, are not aware of the space they're walking into. So 
it's a pretty common factor that an archway represents a way in and out of a space. What's on one side of a wall is different to what's on the other. And usually, for example, if we're walking into a bank from the street, well, different rules apply in a bank than we do on the street. But people don't seem to care anymore. Uh, they just walk in and treat it exactly how they would treat everything else because they themselves don't see the world around them as different. We don't have... Not everybody sees things in kind of a considerate way of how that space should be kept. So, for example, walking somebody's home, some people don't take their shoes off. Whereas, really, you should be asking, right, this is your home, would you like me to take my shoes off? Because it's not your home, therefore the rules might be different. And if you are not doing that, or at least not asking, then you are showing that their space has, you have no respect for their space, it's not their space, it's your space. You are making the world yours, which is, it is very selfish, and that's where the world is going today. Um, that's where you don't have personal barriers and stuff like that. We could go endless into this, and I'm probably going to do a series on most of this as well separately in a bit more detail. Um, so to me, personally, because I know about symbology and I've trained into my mind, you might say this is a detriment, because whenever I pass through a barrier, whether it be a gate, a door, an archway, whatever, I make sure I know that when I walk through that door, I act in accordance to that space as um, courtesies. Because that's the right thing to do. That person has made that space for a reason and you are entering that space and therefore you need to know the rules. Yes, it's okay to say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realise. Uh, tell me about your space. Oh, sorry, I, I wasn't aware of that rule. Right now I've, I've learnt it. I will then carry on from the future. And these are important things we need to be doing as a society but we don't realise because we have no connection of the symbology or what is sacred, which is our point of this book. But equally, um, we can establish commonalities because every room is a room and every room is a border and it's the same, doesn't matter what size or shape or um, what's within, it's still different to what's on the outside. Even if it's empty, we can make it into something new. It represents. And everything we put in that room, or everything that has been put in that room, is there for a reason, has symbolic context, i.e. connections to it that are important. Just because we don't understand them, someone else does. And we can learn by asking, experiencing, and so on. And so when we have that idea of walking in someone else's shoes, well, if you're in somebody else's room, you can try and understand them for the way they are. And this is the same in sacred spaces of worship, such as temples, churches, mosques, whatever. Because in these sacred spaces, they are set up for a specific reason, um, and we can learn. But equally, there's certain aspects that are all linked together, that are all similar commonalities, which is when we start looking at... So I can walk into any sacred space, and I can understand it. That is a fact. Apart from personal touches and, and whatnot, those stand out to you. It would not matter if I walked into the Hagia Sophia, um, the cathedral at Cheltenham or whatever, um, Downton Abbey, the palace, um, Buckingham Palace, or uh, a Mormon church in Salt Lake City, or a Taoist temple in China, or a Greek Orthodox church in Santorini. It does not matter because they're all built on the same premises, which is part of what I'm going to teach you in this book of symbology, because we're looking at the higher spiritual mysteries, and that is all to do with the people who do know what they're doing when they build these spaces. For example, the Freemasons who built all the churches, all the older churches, the decent churches in the United Kingdom, were all built in a certain way, for a certain ritual, for a certain way of teaching what is in this book that's the whole point of them you all face east we all have an altar we all um, have a left and right chapel we all have so many uh, but they're all scaled up to represent parts of the solar system um, 
you know, every single detail within these places are all trying to represent the same thing, which all represent the same as the body, and so on. It's, it's a very complex, detailed system, because they're trying to teach you the universe in these buildings. Now, I know we've jumped out quite a lot, but that's what I'm trying to do. So there's different parts within this study. There is understanding what symbology is in the mind and how it's used. There's understanding what symbology um, and the sacred space represents, i.e. that everything both should and have a meaning to it, um, or has a meaning that has been done by somebody else, but then equally that certain spaces have been used and created on purpose in certain ways to represent certain lessons and teachings to teach you about the universe um, overall. And that's where we get quite complex. And so when we look at things like the circle, now that can be, again, when we look at witchcraft or wicker, the circle, the salt circle around the outside is exactly the same thing as the outer church wall or a burial mound or the pyramids or um, somebody's home or a temple. Or all of these things, it doesn't matter if it's inside or outside, the barrier represents the same thing. And by understanding what it means when we see people doing these rituals and things, that's what they're meant to be doing. Not all of them understand these things, but that's what they're meant to be doing, that's what they're for. A lot of people copy the actions of spreading salt in a circle and say, oh, it's to protect yourself. But actually, it's a mental trigger because we remember, everything we're doing in our lives is linked back to the conscious, subconscious mind of triggering emotions, experiences, and a way of thinking. And so we start to build things on. And now in this book, I very much do start from the beginning. What is a boundary? What is the number zero? Right? Let's look at the floor of a sacred space. What does that mean to you? What does it mean to those in the past? What is the, the floor is extremely important because it's the foundations of everything you place upon it. So when you enter your sacred space, do you take steps up or steps down? Or is it level with the floor? Now this is extremely important because if we step up, we are elevating ourselves mentally. Whether you're not, you know it or not, or are aware of it, when you step up into a room, whether it be one step, two step, three step, or a flight of stairs, you are taking yourself higher in the vibrational content of the universe. You are going up to the heavens, for example. Whereas if you step down, you are descending into a lower plane of vibration, which is all to do with action um, and physical change, whereas the higher ones are all to do with thought, which is why a king's seat or a throne is on three steps, because it's higher than the world around it. Not to be higher as in to look down, but to look up to look upwards into heavens to find more information, more um, thought, more uh, better ways of elevating the mind to create um, understanding. That is the traditional meaning of a throne on three steps. It is not what we think it is today of the king sits above us and looks down. It's too obvious. It's not. That's not what it was for. Equally, when we place a temple, we can place a temple on the top floor, on the bottom floor, or in the middle. And each one has connotations to the practices you will perform there. So next time you go into a temple, or a church, or whatever, if you visit in holiday or whatnot, that matters of which level it's on. Which is why things like Acropolises and, um, you know, when we go to Greece, everything's high up. Yeah, it's all placed on temples. People used to build their forts in England on hills, not because it was defensive, well, partly because it was defensive, but because it was higher up to the heavens where they're mentally trying to reach to become better developed. Um, equally, things like the temples of Hades were underground, and there's a reason for that, but apart from that, it's because it's closer to Yes, core, it's to do with warmth, to do with action, to do with um, 
hidden inner meaning which is all to do with self-development rather than looking out over the kingdom of beyond. Again, there's a lot more details with this one. I'm going to just skip over some of this. Um, but then we look at stuff like the walls and the pillars, the artwork that's in there. It, it, it's endless. Every single thing you see in a sacred space is important. It all has meaning and there's a reason why it's there. And I've visited many of these places and there's always tours going on and things like that. And nobody is aware of any of this when they walk in. So to me, even let's say I'm not a Muslim, but if I went to um, a, you know, a synagogue or whatever, I would have a lot of respect for the space. Not Again, yes, it's respectful because people practice their religion in there, that's fine. But disregarding that, that space to me is sacred because it adheres to the same rules everything in there was made for the same reasons because it all comes from the same place of understanding because symbology is embedded in our subconscious and say an altar is an altar it, it, it works in the same way no matter where it comes from who's using it or what's on it um, and so the book our sacred space goes through all of this, but more importantly, it teaches you how to make your own sacred space. And I'm not talking about, yeah, obviously, at the end of the day, I am talking about doing your own rituals, your own um, subconscious triggers to um, help you better develop your mind, um, to, to reach higher levels of development. That's what it's all down to. But if you weren't looking to do those levels it just adds meaning to your life adds value and that's what we don't have today in modern day society and i give a very good example in this book I actually write down um somebody's uh, kind of life's work and i go through an individual's example of his life of uh, how the work or um, the rituals he goes through throughout the day um, are a build up to the work that he is looking to complete at the end of his project the people he has around him the structure of the room the position of the uh, furniture within the room the rituals of all these details and you will see that it could be classed as OCD but actually it's adding meaning to every single thing you do all day to bring you more focus, more clarity to attaining the goal you want to have in a pure form. It's a way of achieving greatness, which is why really great people tend to be very, um, what would you say, um, just out there, different people. They have different rituals and life practices, but everybody else thinks they're a little bit odd and that's because everything they do is tied into reaching their final end goal for example an athlete all the things an athlete does would seem crazy to everybody else that isn't an athlete in that particular sport the foods they eat, they eat at set times they go to sleep at set times they train at set times and do set things throughout the day it's not just the training session it's the uh, nutritional steps the sleeping in certain beds not being you know not um having the lights turned on at certain um intensities uh during the night because it all fine-tunes their rituals to have the best performance on the final day of the event and um, we we hear about you know athletes turning up to hotels and having their own mattresses ordered because it's part of their ritual. They are able to control that situation so they know what sleep they will have the night before the event. And it's fine details that add that. You know, if everybody's doing roughly the same thing, it's those little things that will maybe give them an edge to, to win at the end of the day. And it's that fine-tuned focus that gives their life meaning, that gives them the best results in the end. And we can all do that in life. I'm not saying it has to be as rigorous or intense but if you want a big uh, greater outcome in life then you need to put the work in and having all these little nuances are symbolic representations of the final goal you're trying to achieve over time and that's how it works so when you're building up to an event say like a wedding for example 
or a birthday or um, a birth child, you will have all these things in place. Now, usually we only do these things once, but you know, if you were to do them again, you would then repeat the same cycles because it led to the completion of that event at that time. So the sacred space is not just about physical um, symbology. It's about um, it's about building the psychological side of a meaning and adding depth to your life in order to fulfill goals and higher development of oneself. So what I've done also is given in this book the universal <laughs> blueprint of the universe version of a sacred space. That is the, the one that's been passed down through time, through different cultures, through different religions, through different um, esoteric um, lodges, um, cults and uh, systems of study such as the Rosicrucians, the Golden Dawn, Freemasons, um, Knights Templar, all these sorts of things. But they say they still apply to the ones in the East and the Middle East as well. It's all the same. We're all trying to teach the same thing because they're universal symbols that represent things that we can use to develop our own mind. So, for example, the gods, Greek gods, are all given names because they represent certain aspects of the human consciousness, such as Mars is all to do with violence, um, war, and, and physical change. But if we, you know, we, we link that to our mind when we see that, or when we need to access that particular mindset before battle, or before we, you know, try and enter a physical event, for example, we can mentally project that image of us being Aries or, or whatever and changing our mindset to match so we can achieve those goals in that way uh, inclined and so we can create mental triggers and that is what the sacred space is for so we can have a space in the mind we call it the mind space for those of us that have um, developed this concept and there's not many people who teach it out there, to be fair. These all these big societies of spiritual thinking, um, nobody that I know has really delved into what the mind space really is. But ultimately, that is the first step of true enlightenment. Um, if you don't know how to use the mind space, everything you do... Again, I'm going to go a little bit off topic here. Everything every system of study does, be it science, be it um, Buddhism, Taoism, um, Rosicrucianism, the study of the Golden Dawn, the A, whatever, um, it all, all of that, it's all the same stuff. It's all different ways to reach the same end, if that makes sense. It's a thousand different paths to reach the first step. And a lot of us get tied up on that road, trying to learn this, that and the other, and, and becoming lost in a sea of information and practices. But usually you only need one or two practices, you need to do them well, and that will eventually get you to that first step. Now usually, for most people I've met, will stand on that first step, look at back at what else they've got, and then go back wandering again. But actually, the first step is that it's the first step of enlightenment. And the creation of the mind space is that first step. Because if you can't use the mind space, if you don't understand symbology, if you don't develop the subconscious and being able to think in images in these ways, you are not able to reach the levels beyond. And trust me, there are a lot of them. And they are very, very difficult to understand even for someone as well practiced um, as the people out there today and again I'm being quite vague because there's no point if you, you kind of at this point you know um, there's a good quote in Admiral in the Mage which is a very famous western book um, it gives you a year's worth of study like a practice to reach the goal um, and that goal is he says well after that you know it like it's the first step on the path to something new, but once you're there, you kind of, you know you're there, and uh, that's, it's up to you then to just follow that path. 
and it's very much like that. It's like the people that have took that first step and are on that path know what that path is and don't need me to explain, whereas everybody else will never really understand that step until they stand on it. So it's it's a grey area of trying to explain to someone what it is. But once you get there, you'll know. So it's like, we'll have that goal in mind um, and try and reach it. And once you get there, well, it's like a roller coaster. It'll just set you off on a path. Um, and then you'll understand what I mean. But by then, you won't need me to explain it. So it's almost a catch-22. We call it uh, stepping beyond the threshold. But then there's more thresholds beyond that. So you know, it's never ending. But the sacred space gives you those tools to work in that mindset, that mind space. And I wish I'd have had this when I started because it would have made things a lot easier. Um, and yeah, so I give an example of, of my mind space, effectively, the tool I use, which was built on the information of all these previous people that have passed it on. And it's a universal mind space, it's a universal template that can be applied to any and all things to help understand the universe around us because these are like if you imagine um, a master key of symbols or a skeleton key to a thousand doors those are the symbols and what they mean behind them that can be allocated to these thousand doors it's the master key effectively and each of these there are ten master keys and each one of the ten master keys has a master key above that is very yeah we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there but that's what the book our sacred space is and it's actually very much more than what i intended it to be when i first wrote it but because of the nature of it that's just the way it ended up um so yeah it's it's an extremely important book and piece of information but teaches you how to develop a higher consciousness it teaches you what symbolism is and at the very base core concept, it teaches you how to add meaning and depth to your own life, your own existence, your own being. And if everybody did this, if everybody had more meaning and, and connection with everything around them, including people, because people, other people, are effectively symbols of their own life. Because, for example, if I listen to somebody and I listen to their life story, I then apply that to their face, and every time I see their face, I see their life story. Most people today don't care about anybody else, let's be honest. How many people take the time to listen to your co-worker's life story? How many people really understand their own parents' life story? Have they ever asked? We simply pick up things that other people want to tell us, but what if they didn't tell us? Would we ever ask? Would we ever know? But if we did, you would take all that information, you apply it to that person's face. Every time you see their face or think of their face, you think of those life stories and therefore gain a wealth of knowledge every time you see that individual. That individual means more to you. If it's somebody off the street you've never met before, you don't know their life, they don't mean anything to you. If you then know that somebody has run a thousand marathons over a hundred different countries, then that person becomes more meaningful to you. <clears throat> That's almost like celebrities, unfortunately. Because if we think about celebrities, it's because we know a lot, or we think we know a lot about that person, the films have been in, the, the books they've written, whatever. And we apply all that information to their face, and when we see that face, we become involved with them. We think we know them. And we know them more than we know the people around us. And that's why we've become so obsessed with them. But that's not the real them. But you don't know their whole lives. Um, but that's a symbol. Their face is a symbol for things you think are related to that person. So then we have another concept, you see, of actual symbols aren't just objects or images. They are people. And it's just, we can do the same thing for sounds eventually. A sound can be a symbol that represents certain things uh, and mental triggers. So we build this elaborate construct in the mind where whenever we walk around the world we live in, 
instead of just seeing objects and people and hearing sounds, they're giving us mental triggers, stimulations of information that we process in our mind um, that we can learn from, build on and become part of. And that's what symbology is. And that's what the book, Our Sacred Space, tries to show you, teach you and gives you examples of how you can apply this to your daily life but also how it's been used in the past or how it should be used <clears throat> so I hope you've enjoyed um, please like, subscribe, follow if you do like it, pick up a book it's definitely worth picking up it's a great wealth of knowledge and help you in your development so please check that out in the link that's it for now, thank you very much, bye bye hello and welcome to the Blueprint of the Universe channel and in this particular video we follow the path that we've been looking at of uh, the books that I've written as part of a series. Now we come to the one of the last books in the series that's in my opinion um, extremely important in the teachings of uh, spirituality, development, self-development, progression and understanding of the universe around us. Um, and it kind of is, it's a book on its own, uh, but it also does link with everything else uh, in this series as well. And it's called Our Sacred Space. Now it covers a variety of topics. Now I'm just going to go through some of the things it includes, but equally give you an overview of what we're talking about here, because it is an extremely complex um, subject as well and it's very difficult to understand or explain fully in such a small video and to get the point across what we're going to do is basically simplize it down um, into an explanation of what symbology really is now when I try and explain to people I'm a symbologist or I study symbology um, and I've took several symbology courses in the past as well which are uh, interesting because obviously I'm just trying to one further my own knowledge this was post um, 